or just kind of keeping up with what the news was and Bob Thompson popped up. You you know who he is, former Fox Sports executive, uh, very much a go-to uh, guest that we had throughout all the realignment, and what was going to happen. And he joins us today because I saw Amazon pop up on my timeline today about the regional sports networks, Diamond Sports Network, and they were going to be involved. Bob, thank you very much with Paul and Craig and Smokey. Um, what does this signal, in your opinion, is this dipping their toes in the water or much bigger than that? I think it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on again. So yes, it's sir. great to be with you guys. Um, you know, I think from, from a diamond standpoint, I really think they kind of pulled a, a rabbit out of their hat here to get uh, um, Amazon to come in, supposedly committing $115 million for 15% of the company and uh, taking over, I guess, for all intents and purposes, their direct-to-consumer offering, which has been... <clears throat> pretty much of a disaster for Valley's. They've had a lot of, or Diamond, um, they had a lot of technical issues with the, with the direct consumer offering. So I think uh, having Amazon and with their experience with the NFL, that's certainly going to help. I think, you know, to get back to your original question, I think for Amazon, clearly they didn't do this, you know, $100, $150 million. It's not a lot of money for Amazon, but Amazon doesn't just, throw money around either you know they're very judicious with their sports acquisition pro you know costs and what properties they buy so i think they've got another plan for this now whether that's you know taking more of an ownership interest and apparently they have the right to uh, put another 50 million in um in the next year and up their increase or up their percentage ownership but i i really think you know it's to get some understanding a little bit our understanding of the rsns they own a piece of the yes network in new york so they've been on the inside somewhat but this will get them in a little bit further and i think for diamond who will be getting rid of the valley's name which i think is a good idea uh it's it's a it's a great win now we just got to get it all through bankruptcy you know the bankruptcy judge has to approve all this and the creditors and and that, <clears throat> apparently the leagues have to approve it as well so um, it'll be an interesting couple of weeks to see if they can get this thing over the finish line. Yeah, it's probably a good thing for Bally as a company as well because this didn't didn't you know work well for them uh, <laughs> at all. <No. laughs> uh, so, Bob, can you like Diamond, which is Sinclair, right? Like that was Sinclair's wing of trying to get into the RSNs. What? Ultimately, did they just get too far out over their skis with this that enabled them to get there uh, to wind up in bankruptcy court? Well, that's a good question, Paul. I think it's a combination of things for Diamond. Number one, they probably overpaid. Mm -hmm. uh, their timing probably wasn't the best um, when uh, the cord cutting, you know, kind of really accelerated. Um, they had significant amount of debt that they used to purchase uh, the RSN. So you're losing subs. You've got an inordinate amount of debt that you're trying to service. And, you know, then they, they just had some issues with a couple of the, uh, you know, specifically Major League Baseball. They got into some kind of head on confrontations. It's usually not the best way to run your business if you depend on those people for your content. But, uh, you know, they take some people off. And so, you have those things, and ultimately, Sinclair is pretty much out of it. Um, they still have some ownership interest, but they've written off pretty much the entire investment and uh, really have no um, – they're, they're providing some technical services and some administrative services, but for all intents and purposes are out of the management of the RSN group. It cracks me up when we hear, and I know what you're saying, that throwing $100 million at something is not a big deal for them, and then maybe they can add another $50 million. They have all the money they've ever want, but they always want more, and it's because they are judicious, and they're not just going to throw it out there, which is always what you mentioned about the Pac-12. So having said all of that, does that start any kind of Amazon, Apple, et cetera, starting to view or look at what the other one's doing? I would assume there's some looking over the shoulder. Um, you know, I... Another thing that came out today was, you know, and Amazon was, was very busy. They signed a deal with the NBA to air games in Mexico. 
So, you know, and, and the word out on the street is that they are very interested in some portion of the NBA rights that are up for bid. Um, so I, I think, you know, they keep getting a little bit more involved and people are definitely becoming more comfortable with streaming. I mean, the Peacock game with 23 million viewers, that was, you know, certainly the most, certainly exceeded any Amazon game. And, and, and the, most important thing was from a technical standpoint, it came off flawlessly. So the properties would be more and more comfortable with streaming. It's just coming up with the right mix between kind of traditional linear as well as some digital streaming stuff that might be behind a paywall. Bob, uh, for Amazon, I mean, this is, you know, they're just growing and growing and growing and there's, there's no way to stop them. How do you think in that chasing that maybe some of the other streamers that they're not Apple, but like, you know, I know that there's some talk about Paramount and Warner's, uh, or I guess the Max, uh, coming together because that's a bit of a mess. And do they start maybe trying to get into sports more than they are? I know Paramount has a little bit, but more because Amazon's doing this and you got to somehow compete with them. I think, um, you know, it's a good point. I think there's going to be some consolidation and that that's usually what happens in the the media world is everybody tries to do it on their own. Then they realize they can't necessarily do it on their own. So then they merge and we're getting to that point. I think that's, you know, the, the WBD and the paramount discussions you hear floating around is certainly epitomizes that kind of a scenario that could be getting ready to happen. Bob Thompson, former Fox Sports CEO, with us on 365 Sports. So uh, the NFL Network and ESPN was another one of those stories that kind of popped up. Uh, Is that um, sleeping with the enemy, or what is that? I don't know how to term that one. I think, you know, it's certainly a – it's called a marriage of convenience. (laughs) <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I think it could be something that could be good for both parties. Um, you know, the NFL network has really kind of struggled. I mean, the network looks great, but it's, it's always kind of struggled from um, a distribution standpoint and a rate standpoint. And they've always felt they should get more for it and hooking their wagon to the horses that ESPN has certainly could be a benefit to them when it comes to distribution and uh, distribution leverage. I think also that ESPN could help with the, with the product, uh, the overall product that's available on the, on the network. And then the flip side for ESPN is, you know, it certainly cements you to your, with what is without a doubt, your most important product. Uh, You know, ESPN is all in on the NFL. There's, Mm -hmm. you know, no other, no other way to say that. So, uh, you want to, to the extent you can, cement that relationship and, and doing some sort of a deal where there's an uh, equity flop of some sort um, or joint ownership. That certainly would effectuate that uh, pretty quickly. Do you feel that Disney and ESPN are coming out of the woods to their struggles from a year ago? Um, I think they're still pretty deep in the forest, but... <laughs> I think there's, um, you know, a lot of it just has to do with the economy and, and, and if we can kind of see an end to the cord cutting, and even if there's not an end to the cord cutting, just coming up with a, a rationale that is a combination of streaming and linear that, you know, works for everybody from a financial standpoint. And the sooner we can get to that spot and everybody knows how they're going to operate going forward, then you can start making some plans. There's some deals still that have to be done. You know, you've got the NBA out there. You've got the UFC out there. You've got the CFP playoffs out there with the additional games. So some people are going to have to decide uh, kind of where they're at here pretty soon on going forward and, and how much money they have to spend because there's some bets that are going to be made. Bob, is there a strategic problem, the economic system that pays all the bills for college football is either appears in a decline, pay TV, or not producing the value that's needed to – support what they have currently or in future rights fees? You mentioned the college football playoff. Well, you know, the money's not going to flow freely forever and, and, and nothing's going to continue to just go up in a straight line either. So they, there's going to have to be some ulterior revenue streams that come forth and, and whether that's 
related to uh, gaming, um, data, you know, whatever it is, there are certain things that the collegiate world, I think, needs to monetize better than they have to this point. Um, the professional leagues seem to do a much better job with things along the lines of, of those areas I just mentioned and, and, and licensing and premium uh, events experiences, things along those lines. So I think from the collegiate standpoint, they're going to really have to uh, get into the, you know, the, the deep weeds on how to make um, the experiences better and how to grow revenue streams in, uh, which to this point have been um, untapped by them. I now have learned how to use YouTube TV, which if you knew me, that is a, that's an accomplishment. Um, I did it because the Texas Oklahoma game, oh no, the Texas Alabama game. I'm not sure what was going on there, but I couldn't get it unless I got it on YouTube TV. How how many like where are they in this entire conversation? Are they even a player? Well, YouTube TV really, from a video standpoint, has kind of like three products. They've got you know you just go on YouTube and watch mm -hmm. videos, and whether that's you know cuddly puppies or <laughs> guys doing stupid stuff. Uh, which there's a lot of that on there too. And then they've got YouTube TV, which is their cable like product, which is probably what you're talking about. And my guess is you went on there because the, um, you had a Tegna station on whatever your, your existing right. thing was and you were blacked out. They dropped it. So I had to do the same thing here with, uh, with direct TV and the NBC affiliate. And then their third, their third property is the, um, Sunday ticket which I, I thought they did a great job the first year with that. Uh, no real technical issues to really speak of. And, and they came up with some of those game casts or they, where they group three or four different games together, which I thought was, was really well done. So they're certainly a player. I think what they have to try and figure out is, do they want to be a rights owner or do they just want to be a distributor? And which is what they've primarily been in the past. Certainly, they bought the Sunday ticket rights, but they're not having to produce anything. All they're doing is re-airing the CBS and, and Fox feeds. Uh, so they're really asking, well, they own the rights. They're really just the distributor of those games. So what, what YouTube slash Google has to figure out is, do they want to actually buy something, or are they just comfortable being a distributor? My, my only uh, technical recommendation to them on next year on the – on there, they'll, they do it with college football as well uh, on YouTube TV. Is let me pick the four games as opposed to you doing that, which I think is probably a pretty easy thing for people at Google to program. Uh, <laughs> you mean like when there's the drop down level, you can pick one game or you have four different, yeah, like almost four, like picture like in pictures a box. Back yeah, in the yeah day. four in a box. Yeah. And so the, the only. The only problem I had with it is like, well, if I wanted to watch these three games and then another one that was in another one, I would I would have a, a game down here in the corner that I'm like, I don't really care about this one. I'd rather have that one in here with these other three. But that's a pretty minor like complaint, you know, that I, I think is easily solvable. Bob, um, we had you on so much about realignment and rights and all that. Um, the ACC and Florida State are about to lock or, or locking horns right now about the grant of rights and, and how you get out of it and who's going to pay what. I do have one question because you would know because you've seen and held grants of rights in your hand. Um, why would the ACC have to have this under lock and key like it's the Magna Carta? That's a good question. I, you know, and I, I don't know so much the grant of rights was under lock and key because everybody signed it. So you get mm -hmm. a copy, if you sign it, you get a copy of it and you can find the thing on the internet. If you mm -hmm. you know, if you have 10 minutes and have a good search engine, what's under lock and key is the, uh, ESPN agreement. Mm -hmm. And that's for a reason, you know, you can't have those kind of things floating around. And if you all of a sudden 16 people have copies of it, it's going to get out. And, you know, media companies go to great lengths to protect the um, terms and conditions that are included in those because if it's out there, it can be used against you in, in uh, other negotiations. But what they were requiring and why it, I guess, took so long for uh, some people to uncover some what we call unsavory clauses in that agreement, was that re they required you to go to the ACC headquarters and sit in a room and somebody sat in that room with you to make sure you weren't taking pictures of this agreement with your cell phone 
and you could basically go through it piece by piece, but you could never leave with the deal. And as a result of that, those visits by Florida State, some of the things that have come up is certainly that, you know, there's no guarantee that the rights are going to be there after 2027. And um, some other things that came out in the court hearing or the filings by by Florida State and, you know, which was also kind of cross-sued by, uh, by the ACC. So you really need to keep that stuff confidential and the networks require it. And so the conference was just, you know, fulfilling the obligations that they had to the network. It, it did feel to me reading some of those notes that I don't know if the like bullied strong arm, but like that ESPN was able to kind of pressure the ACC into this deal because I kept wondering like, okay, you had it in 20, uh, like 11, 12, like whenever they signed it the first time. And then the re up in 2016, like there had been some shifts in that 2016 is the year that kind of befuddles me that, that wasn't a little bit more pushback uh, on that. And that ESPN maybe kind of pushed them to like, it's, it's now, or never and they didn't want to wind up in never yeah i think that the only thing i can um maybe add to that is they they really wanted that conference channel and that's kind of where 16 they had the leverage there because that's when they finally got the channel and they got the launch date for the channel and they knew it was going to go in 19 and um that's the only thing i that where espn probably had the leverage uh, what happened after that as it relates to, you know, extending certain options or trigger dates for the additional years beyond 2027, I, I don't, I don't know. It's hard, that's hard to say, not be, having not been in the room on how that went down. But I think that, um, you know, maybe ESPN was seeing some cracks in the, in the, in the business at that point and probably wanted to, um, extend the date where they had to make that decision to extend that deal through 2036 because, you know, for years, everybody thought it went through 2036. And I remember last time I was on, you know, mm-hmm. Smokey, you asked me, have I ever heard of one of those deals? Like, oh, no, you know, cause I, I didn't, I just couldn't env- envision it, but apparently ESPN, you know, had some uh, leverage as it relates to the ACC. And, and what I can only surmise is that it had to do with, them wanting an ACC network that they had been wanting for years. You know, the Big Ten launched in 2007 and the AC, SEC in 2013. And here they were still sitting without a channel, which they really felt they needed. And so whatever it took to get that network launched, I think they were prepared to do. Uh, Bob, one more question, if you don't mind. And as always, thanks for your time. Of the 23 million or so that watched the Chiefs and also uh, Kansas City and Miami, how much of that 23 million was the markets of television, Kansas City or Miami, or the whatever you call them? And then secondly, how many do they know yet how many actual new subscribers they have, or is that going to take some time? Um. Well, say so. It's it's twenty three million, and I believe the Kansas City the fast the fast Nielsen's I saw in Kansas City and Miami it was I want to say it was about a com combination of like a million three or a million mm-hmm. four yep. viewers. Okay, so we now so we we take that out and let's just say it's for roundabout numbers we're down to twenty two, um, and that's twenty two million viewers. That's not twenty two million households. So when you talk about new subscribers, they're, they're not going to get one for every viewer because many people watch those games together with other folks in one household. So you have to subtract the households that already had it, had Peacock. And so if you want to say, okay, the gain of new subscriptions above that was their, you know, their, their incremental acquisition. And they know they just aren't telling us yet. It's, you know, mm-hmm. stuff's all very, with it, with it being uh, digitally streamed, they, they can add those numbers fast. And, you know, my guess is they're probably just going to sit on it for a while and they're trying to really figure out um, how much <laughs> incremental gain they had. The other thing is they're also going to want to wait for a month and see how many of those people are still there after a month. 
Oh, you, that's you, right. You yeah, you can shift. subscribe and, and and then cut cut it off, right? Exactly. So you, you really want to see, you know, what your churn level is going to be, and the churn is basically people who churn out of the pro out of the out of the property um, or the product, and we won't know that until you know February first or thirty days after you know the original when when most people probably the site the biggest sign up day ever for them was probably Saturday morning. And you know, my, my expectation is that their biggest disconnect day has either already occurred or it will be 30 days from, from that Saturday uh, in January. And then some have forgot. Hey, they still hey, have hey, it. They don't even know. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's but oh, that's yeah. the key. That's the Columbia yeah. house. That's the CD club. Yep. Uh, that's that, right. yeah, dude, right. they, that's they how just, it is. They still keep coming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, no, I, I would assume that a large chunk of those are Taylor Swift fans, Bob, that uh, saw her, uh, got to see it. It's over now. There's not another game on Peacock, so they can um, unsubscribe until Peacock makes some sort of deal with Taylor Swift again. Yeah, until she does a live that, concert on their station or what? Are there? Yeah, there was the, there was an interesting thing I saw today that NBC or Peacock announced that uh, the Oppenheimer movie is coming to Peacock. Coincidentally. Early mm. February, when all those people might be <laughs> thinking about <laughs> disconnecting. Yeah, so smart. there's there's clearly some planning being made, uh, you know, and then there'll be a big push because they've got the Olympics coming up. So, um, yeah, I think it certainly attracted a significant number of new um, subscribers to Peacock. Now the question becomes: Can they can they hang on to them, and uh, can they? convert them into, you know, long-term Peacock subscribers. Bob, as always, thank you. Hope you're hitting them straight. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. All right, guys. Take care. Have a good week. Bob Thompson, former Fox Sports CEO with us on 365 Sports. Appreciate his knowledge. Patrick.